social workers. Um, welcome, welcome. We're so excited you're here. Happy Social Work Month. Um, and we're, we're, we're so excited to um, have you here for our panel, Social Work Practice in Behavior and Mental Health. Um, so uh, you guys are the next generation of social workers, and it's nice to have you here as, as our students. Um, uh, as, as noted, we are going to uh, be recording this. Um, and so I'm gonna ask a few questions, introductory questions of our panel um, to get things going. And then we'll open up the chat and, and feel free to ask um, whatever question that you, you have. And we'll just uh, use the hour and, and have some great conversation. Um, also, um, why, why the panelists are introducing yourself, feel free to introduce yourself as, a, as students in the chat. Go ahead and um, let us know uh, what year you're in, if you're bachelor's, MSW, if you're gonna be graduating soon, if you're looking for an internship or just a job or you're just here to learn, um, kind of kind of let us uh, know a little bit, a bit about you in the chat. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and then we'll kind of uh, let you guys ask questions in just a second. But uh, to kick things off, um, I am ex I'm excited to have both Margaret and Melissa here and want to thank them so much for their time and effort. I know uh, they both are such uh, busy individuals, so it's nice that, that um, they gave up their time today. So um, Margaret and Melissa, I'll, I'll have Margaret go first. Um, will you just take a moment and introduce uh, yourself and your roles at, at your agency? Um, so Margaret will go first and then Melissa will have you go right after. Good morning. Uh, my name is Margaret Macy. I am an LCSW and I work for Bayless Integrated Healthcare. And we are a homegrown Arizona company that was started um, by the Bayless family. And my current role there is I am the sole director of any um, behavioral health student intern. So I have a pretty robust program and we all come together and a couple days a week and we see clients virtually still, um, but hopefully that might change in the future, who knows? Uh, but yeah, that's what I do right now at Bayless, um, supervise interns, we do the interview, we get you ready to go for clinical life as a social worker. And I'm Melissa Zimmerman. Um, I work at Jewish Family and Children's Services of Southern Arizona here in Tucson. Um, I'm the Vice President of Clinical Services, which means I oversee all of our behavioral health programming for the agency. I'm an LMSW. I've been in the field for about 14 years, um, and I'm a proud uh, MSW. I love being a social worker, so I'm really excited to be here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, both welcome, Melissa and Margaret. Um, my name is Brett Peterson. I'll be the moderate, moderator for today. I am a full-time ASU faculty, um, a lecturer here in the Advanced Direct Practice Program, and also uh, the coordinator of our Yuma program. So we have students in, and we have uh, 21 students in Yuma, um, and I, I'm here, here in Yuma uh, with that program. Um, also have worked in the uh, field of behavioral health as a licensed clinician, both in community and private practice, and um, excited to be moderating this, this practice. Um, so um, both Margaret and, Jen, uh, and, and Melissa, um, just kind of um, let us know a little bit about um, kind of um, your community of practice, um, why why are social workers so important? What a little more about kind of what you do as a, a clinician and kind of a little more about your your agency. So so our students kind of get a picture of, of, of what it's like. Sure. Um, I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, I started my social work life. I, I graduated from NAU with my BSW and then I came down. They didn't have an, an, um, a master's program at that point up there. And I came down to ASU and did uh, this ASU program and I graduated in 06. And at that point I was a um, child welfare stipend student. So uh, the Department of um, Child Safety, they had given me sort of a par partial scholarship to be a part of um, their track. 
And that's what I did for about five years after graduation. And then after, after that, that was really hard work, you know, working with child protective services. And I transitioned into medical social work. I never thought I would be a clinician. That's why I share that part because I did 10 years um, postgraduate work in the community long before I ever thought about what clinical social work was. I was like a PAC student. I was administrative. I was like, you know, we're going to, I'm going to go develop policy. And then here I am doing the most direct practice you could probably do because I, I am an EMDR therapist. So I'm a, I'm a trauma therapist. That's my bread and butter. That's that's where I live. That's what I, I love to talk about. I love to teach. I'm very, very passionate about um, people really, truly understanding the impact of trauma on our brains and our bodies and our families and how it can go down generationally. Um, so I, I still, to this day, am shocked that I like, I'm a therapist and I sit in a room and I talk to people all day. I really never um, saw this for myself. Uh, Margaret, what, that, what, what yeah. was that impetus that led you there? Because we oftentimes hear of people with individual uh, direct practice going into kind of the more macro work. Um, but yeah, kind of what was that there? And then also, this is really interesting because sometimes people think we're so locked in if we did PAC or if we did event practice. And so kind of tell me a little bit um, about kind of what that switch was to kind of, to sure. more direct practice. I, um, the macro piece is what drew me to social work in the beginning. When I, I was a communications major and I took a intro to social work class at NAU and I, I, the, I walked out of that class and I was like, oh yeah, I gotta change my major. So it was like an additional year um, because as soon as I was introduced to social work, I was like, this is, this is me. Like I, I am a social worker, like degree or no degree. That's what I discovered in that class. Um, and so I really wanted to be a part of change on a larger level. Uh, I thought that that was the only way we could create change. And, you know, being a student and knowing how expensive school is, I was like, okay, I'm going to temporarily go into this child protective world and see what that's about. Um, and that work, you only, you really truly, I feel like only understand the severity and the difficulty of that work if you do it. Like we as social workers have a much better idea probably than the average population about the difficulty in, in child safety work. But until you're doing it, you really don't know um, how intense and overwhelming and, and also rewarding it can be. And so I became a mother myself during my time with CPS. And that became kind of a conflict for me because, you know, I was like, I would, you know, die for my children. I'd walk through fire for my kids. And yet here I was seeing all these children just kind of being, you know, put through the ringer and being in unsafe situations. So that was a real internal conflict. And so that's why I was like, okay, what else can I do? Because at, for, at some point I thought I was gonna like, I don't know, be a lobbyist for like protective services or I don't even know how that would all work because I, I just wanted change to happen so much for that particular system. And then I did five years with medical social work and it was at that point I started to recognize the value and what clinical work was really about. Because, you know, in a hospital situation, it's emergency, right? Like it's, I mean, people are coming in, it's, it's brief, um, it's an acute situation. However, I was the oncology social worker. And so when you're an oncology social worker, you actually do get to have many more interactions with, with patients and their families. And that was kind of my first taste. And I, and I realized the reward and how exciting it was to like be a part of someone's life for an extended period of time. Most of everything I had done up until I kind of switched the oncology unit, which was a couple years into my medical rotation, um, I didn't, I, I had just, it was like, I saw somebody and then they were gone and that was it. I never had any closure. I never had any idea what happened. Um, and so that's why I was like, okay, I really think I wanna pursue what this could look like um, all the while still thinking, I'm just going to get my license. I'm just going to get my independent license. And then I'm going to go back to doing what I, you know, thought I loved at that point. But, um, that's what it was. It was, it's kind of a long winded answer, but, um, it was that point when I saw when people remembered that, like, I, I knew their dog's name or I followed up and I was like, Hey, how was the visit with your dog? You know, like having that history with people, um, that's what I found really appealing about the clinical work. And how, so when I, when I got to clinical work, I didn't 
I didn't feel like I needed to know how to be with people. My 10 years and, and, and my social work experience, I felt very comfortable building rapport, speaking with people. What I had to do as a clinician is figure out what kind of clinician did I want to be. And I fell into the trauma work because uh, my stepfather um, is, a, is a veteran, is a Vietnam veteran. And so seeing his progression and not being diagnosed correctly for what, 30 plus years, um, that's when I was like, okay, I wanna, I wanna see what this is about. And then of course, we all know that trauma is more than just war, uh, but that's kind of how I got started. And what really, um, we talk a lot about, in maybe in all social work, but we talk about you know planning of these seeds, like any interaction we could have with another human. And it's almost like, we don't always know the ripple effect. And when you do the um, micro work and you're in it with that person, you might not immediately see the change, but the changes felt throughout their life and their, their family systems. So that's what I think is really rewarding. So as far as kind of why, where I am today and how I got there, um, I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology at U of A. Um, I immediately started in the field as a direct practice worker. Um, I started in a respite program and a day program, which meant I spent a lot of time with youth in the community, sometimes um, chasing them down the street, <laughs> sometimes uh, being physically assaulted. We worked with really at-risk youth. Um, and even though it was really, really hard, I found it really rewarding. Um, I was moved into a supervisor position, which I love. I still got to keep one foot in the direct practice, but I also was able to lead other people, teach them the skills that I had learned. Um, and I was really happy where I was, um, you know, but I got to the point where I started thinking about therapy because I was working with therapists in addition to doing the direct work in more in-home community settings. Um, and I saw that the progress that people can make in therapy and everything just sounded so interesting to me. Um, and I said, I'm going to go back to grad school. I'm going to take the skills that I've learned thus far um, and learn how to be a therapist. So I had worked only with children and adolescents before grad school. And I was convinced that that's who I was going to work with forever. That was going to be, you know, the population I worked with. Um, but as I got closer to going to grad school, I started to think about expanding that. And I chose an internship at a substance use residential facility um, for adults, um, for women, which was totally out of my comfort zone. But I purposely chose that to kind of see what the other side was like. Um, and I loved working with adults. Um, and I realized that, you know, I started learning about trauma in grad school, and I realized that I actually had quite a bit of vicarious trauma from the work I was doing before, and no one had really talked to me about that, so I didn't know what to do with it. Um, so it was kind of eye-opening for me to put those pieces together. Um, I loved working with adults. I chose my second internship at an outpatient clinic um, as, a, you know, a full therapist, got my caseload, um, and I loved it. I loved working with a diverse group. I worked with um, anywhere from like 16 up. Um, the internship I was at was pretty uh, intense. I had a caseload of about 35 people, but I loved it. Um, and I think it it's what prepared me kind of to move forward. Um, so I got to see a lot of different clients. Um, I fell in love with some of the classes I was doing. The program I went to for my grad school was University of Denver. Um, and the way that it's set up is you have specific classes for different modalities. So I would be in my CBT class um, and I would be able to do that work directly with the clients at my internship. I feel like I was doing everything to Fidelity and it was just so exciting. I got to see the progress that I was reading about in books, uh, hearing the lectures, um, and I just fell in love with it. So. I got uh, a job offer from that agency when I graduated. Um, I was all in, I was super excited. Um, and about three, four months into it, I got a call from the agency I used to work for in Arizona in Tucson, asking me if I'd be willing to come back uh, to step into a director role. And it was a really great opportunity for me. Uh, most people don't get that opportunity you know, after they graduate. Um, and I did a lot of soul searching. I was very torn because I loved the direct work, but I also loved being in a leadership position. So after a week of 
like 15 different pros and cons list of all different types. Um, I decided that I was going to move back. My husband and I missed Tucson. Um, I was in Colorado and not loving the snow uh, and the driving in snow. So that was a big motivator for me. Um, so I moved back to Tucson uh, in 2015 started as a director for uh, a residential program called the Assessment Intervention Center, which served really high risk uh, youth and adolescents um, who are at risk of being removed from the home, being placed outside the home. Many of them had been through multiple residential placements, um, very severe trauma um, that they had experienced. And I felt really lucky because when I came in that the people in the program had worked with challenging behaviors before, um, but they really hadn't gotten any training in trauma-informed care and the connection between trauma, brain development, and the behaviors that we were seeing. Um, and the behaviors we were seeing in that program were really, really intense. Um, we took some of the kids that couldn't be placed anywhere else in the state. Um, we worked with a youth who, on the way to a different placement, kicked all the windows out of a van. We worked with some of these really intense behaviors and the staff saw them um, and were compassionate, but they didn't really have that link between where these behaviors came from. And so there was a disconnect. So I found it really rewarding to do a lot of training on trauma, to help them come up with interventions um, that would assist the person, assist the youth in making progress in a different way, approaching it in a different way. Um, after a few years doing that, um, I got, I started thinking about how much I liked working with adults before. And I said, well, maybe that's, you know, kind of the direction I want to go back to. Um, so at that point, I expressed interest in working with adults and I was moved to a different program. Um, we were just starting to serve adults at the agency I was at in an outpatient context. So I became the director of adult services and got to oversee case management services, um, some therapy services, a whole different diverse uh, array of, of different types of outpatient services. I also was able to start taking interns. Um, so I got my very first intern. Um, it was actually someone who reached out to me in the community from University of Boston um, that was really looking for a social worker. Um, they were in an online program and I fell in love with working with interns. Um, I found it to be so extremely rewarding. So after that first person, I started taking interns from ASU. Um, I had, you know, started with two, then it was four, then it was five. Um, I did as much as I could um, and really loved it. And what we did with the interns is we were able to start group therapy services that we hadn't been able to offer before in my particular program. Um, so I started doing a CBT group, a DBT group, um, and I would do alongside the interns, um, starting more in kind of a primary role. And then as the semester went on, you know, they were more of the leader of the group. Um, so we were able to expand our services to clients, which was really exciting. Um, and I think the, the interns found it really rewarding because we were building something, you know, from the ground up. Um, I was also doing therapy throughout this entire time. So even though I, I moved back and kind of be, went back into a leadership role, I was still doing some therapy on the side, which I really liked. Um, then about three and a half years ago, I applied for a position at JFCS as the Vice President of Clinical Services, um, taking more of a macro approach. Um, I'm able in my role to supervise all of the clinical supervisors who then in turn supervise the therapist. Um, as well as a supervisor of an in-home program. So I'm not doing the direct work anymore, but I still feel very connected. I have an amazing group of supervisors. We have around 30 clinicians when we're fully staffed. Um, and we have people who specialize in just about everything. Um, we're an organization that really focuses on training. So I send clinicians to trauma-focused CBT training within their first year working with us. Um, after their first year, we send everyone to EMDR training, which is really unusual as a nonprofit agency because um, Margaret probably say that it's a pricey training and kind of hard to, to do that. But we have a special grant through the Victims of Crime Act called Project Safe Place, where we're able to work with people who've been victims of a crime even if they don't have insurance um, or they have a different type of insurance. So we work with Medicaid clients, Medicare, and then we also have this grant program. The grant program allows us training funds, which is really unique and very, very important. 
Um, so that's what I do today. Um, I'm, I love what I do. I do a lot of speaking events. I do a lot of trainings in the community. Um, that's something I started when I moved back to Tucson um, and also became a big passion for me. Um, I'm part of the Southern Arizona Trauma Informed Network. We do free trainings on trauma throughout the community. Um, I do trauma informed suicide prevention training. Just did one of those in December. Um, trainings on compassion fatigue, um, trauma in the brain, all of those types of things. So I'm really lucky because I get to have my hand in all these different pots. Um, and I guess what I would say about that is the reason I chose social work, you know, when I was thinking of going back to grad school to be a therapist, you know, I said, well, should I go and get my master's in counseling? Should I get it, you know, in social work? And after talking to a lot of people, you know, it really seemed like with social work, I could do so many more things. Um, so not to, you know, bad mouth counseling at all, but, you know, I really made that decision based on the fact that there was a lot of diversity. And I knew that, you know, I could go be a therapist, but if I really don't like that, I can go into policy work. Um, I could work in schools. I could work in private practice. There were so many different options. Um, and I have to say that when I work with staff um, who haven't gotten their master's yet, we have some bachelor's level uh, folks in our different programs and they'll come to me and say, well, how did you choose social work? And I literally say, well, take a seat. Um, and I kind of go on my little lecture about, you know, not, I don't want to sway you, but here's all the reasons that I, I suggest you be a social worker. Um, and in addition to being able to work in so many settings and do so many different things as a social worker, a big piece of it for me is the social justice piece. Um, you know, I knew as soon as I started that grad program that I was meant to be a social worker versus, you know, marriage family therapist versus a counselor, um, because it really, it was really important to me to bring those social justice pieces into my work. Um, so I think that kind of sums it up. Thank you, Melissa and Margaret for, for sharing your stories. Um, yeah, Melissa, I, um, yeah, never want to badmouth another helping uh, profession, but um, I always um, I always tell this story. Uh, when I was at a community mental health agency, our clinical director was a uh, licensed counselor, and um, when we would do staffing and kind of pass out uh, all the clients that had been intakes and and kind of staffing them with with um, different therapists, um, anytime there was a what I would consider a very difficult case a CPS was involved or just just a lot of difficulties. Um, our clinical director would say, oh, give give that to, to one of the social workers. Um, they'll know what to do. And I, I always use that as bragging rights with my uh, my uh, colleagues um, that were ca licensed counselors. But really what 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 that was saying is that we as social workers give that training and systems and and understand that it's just not not the the person, but there's so many layers. And so cases, uh, and often the case uh, when people have been traumatized and stuff, there's so many systematic pieces to it. And we are, as social workers are uniquely, um, I think, trained to do that. So it, it, yeah. So thank you for bringing that up, Melissa, because it just reminded me of that. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question, and then I'm gonna go to your questions. So if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat, and, and we'll use the remaining of the time after this question to answer your questions. But both Melissa and Margaret, um, we have lots of students kind of deciding, like, hey, you know, they're they're looking at, at internships, and um, they they're kind of deciding like whether I, you know, should I go into kind of clinical practice? So I wanted you kind of just briefly, just maybe give the pros and the cons of what maybe like uh, clinical practice. And both of you have had such wide experience. I think you're both able to do this really well. But kind of what, what students should consider when kind of thinking about maybe going into a career that, that uh, have a clinical nature. Um, Melissa, we'll start with you real quick. Oh, and you want to go? Then we'll, oh, yeah. And then we'll go, Melissa, and then we'll go Margaret, or vice versa. Whoever wants to go. I'll go. Margaret, you um, go. Okay. So I wanted to say real quickly that I currently supervise MSW students and Masters of Counseling students. And ironically enough, however, it fell this last cohort, this fall cohort that is now, you know, coming through, um, I'm more heavy on my Masters of Counseling students than I am my social work students. 
And I just had a new social work student join me in January. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because like the, the framework that we have as social workers is so different, so, so different than somebody who's in a master's of counseling program or somebody who's in a marriage and family therapy program. Um, we just have a different lens. And I know that like people say that and it sounds like trite maybe, or just like a little watered down, but that is, it is absolutely true. Masters of Counseling students do not get the education and training and understanding that we as social workers get from a cultural standpoint, um, from like understanding, like just what Brett was saying, that it's not just what's going on with this person right now in this situation. It's how has this person's whole life and interaction and attachment and relationships affected how they are now? And what can we do to help them moving forward? Um, so when I think about like what you should consider, um, I always go back to my own values. So I do a lot of, um, in conjunction with my, my trauma work, I do a lot of work with acceptance and commitment therapy. And a big part of acceptance and commitment therapy is knowing your values, understanding and, and staying true to, to the values because the grind and the difficulty we feel in life often is a grind between we're acting outside of our values. And when I was introduced to social work, my personal values and the and the values in social work aligned so closely that I I was like, okay, this is like, this is truly what I have to do. Um, but the beauty of what we do is that, yes, it's important right now for you to kind of have an idea, but you don't know what you don't know. You don't know that you, you know, you might have this idea that I'm going to go and I'm going to do macro work and I'm going to lobby. And, and then you get introduced to this little, just by circumstance, you just get introduced to something else and you go on this entire different path and journey. And I think that social work is unique to that. That doesn't happen for a lot of people. You can have all these different tracks and all like do community work, do school work, do individual work. Um, and so what I would suggest is thinking about what you value most like right now here currently in the here and now not in five years from now or what you did five years before but really truly doing that self-evaluation like what do i really want to do right now knowing that that can change like you don't have to be stuck in one thing or one job with social work we will always be employable we will always have work in this profession we are recession proof we are we will always be an important part of the community and that's what I think is kind of our um, our blessing and our curse is that we know our value. We know what we can do, whether it's direct practice or macro practice or somewhere in between. But the onus is on us as a as a, a community of social workers to let others know what we really are capable of. Um, and I don't think that that happens really well. So just sitting back with yourself, like, where do I want to go? What do I want to do? Is very important but i would also give you this caveat do not wait on your license <laughs> don't do that whether you are gonna like graduate and you're gonna do macro work and you're working for the state and you're doing something there still apply to the board and still get your your lmsw because you never know what kind of work you're going um to land in and that ms that lmsw allows you to do so much more like bill insurances and now if you're going to do hospital social work you need to have that license um because i'll tell you going back after 10 years of work and being you know an msw in the community and then switching to licensed work that was like going back to school that was difficult however if you do it now while it's all fresh it will open up more doors so you can pick and choose what you want to do if somebody had told me 10 years ago that i would be doing intensive direct practice with a very high acuity of clients most of my clients have you know chronic ptsd um, we have, i work with a lot of borderline um, personality a lot of personality disorders in the trauma work um, i never would have believed you and if somebody had told me i was going to be working with students i would be like you're out of your mind like i would never do that however what i have found for myself is that this current role is truly the most um, rewarding work I've ever done because I get, I do get to hit all of the levels. 
of social work. I, I am an individual therapist, so there's that that piece. Then I work with students who that's a community piece. And then on the larger level, I get to do things like this. I get to go and I get to talk to students. I get to go and I get to educate others on the the amount of things that you can do with a social work degree. Um, so I never thought I would have a job where I could hit all of those very important places for us as social workers, but you can. And that's really what I want you guys to know is that you can really truly do whatever your heart desires. You just have to know what it is first. Um, to piggyback on that, I think I'll speak more from an employer organizational perspective. Um, I would suggest that if you have any thoughts of wanting to do clinical work, if, even if it's just a teeny tiny spark, like that might be interesting. Strongly encourage you to do a clinical internship um, because I think it is easier, like Margaret just shared, it was kind of like going back to school for her to you know, do the licensed work and get into the, the direct practice. I'll say that as an employer, we, uh, we hire new graduates. That's not a problem, you know, we don't say as a therapist we're hiring, you need to have this many years of experience. But at the same time, we look at the internships to determine if someone has some experience. Um, we are a provider that focuses on trauma treatment. We are known in the community as being that. Um, so when we look and we have a newer graduate applying for a job, we specifically look at what they've done in their internship. And I know we're not the only person who does that. We're not the only organization that does that. Um, I would not feel comfortable hiring someone who's never done clinical work just because we expect as a lot of places that within a few weeks, you're gonna have a full caseload. You know, we try as much as we can, but I will tell you that the reality of the work is that a lot of times you're jumping in, um, you know, and we have some clinicians who within three weeks have a full caseload you know, of 35 clients. So we would never want to put someone in that position. Um, it would be too overwhelming. They would get burned out. So if you have just an idea like, hey, that might be interested or interesting, or, you know, I might not want to do that now, but maybe in a few years, I would say start with trying the clinical internship, try the clinical work. Um, that will give you a path to getting a job in that way. Whereas if after a few years, you decide it's not for you, or even after your first internship, um, you know, you can move into more of a macro position. You've had experience in the field, um, but I will say it's harder to come into a clinical job if you don't have experience. I know that kind of stinks because, you know, we want to think there's these entry-level positions, but it's not as much the case for therapists. Um, we really look for people who can step in and that we, we feel confident, um, you know, when you look for a clinical internship, when you look for a job doing direct clinical work, you want to ask questions about supervision. Um, I can't stress that enough. Um, you want to ask, you know, not only who's going to supervise me, how often am I going to have individual supervision? How often am I going to have group supervision? Are there opportunities for peer consultation? Those things are all really important. And I will say, having worked at a few different places, they are not all equal amongst places. Um, you know, that's something I take a lot of pride in where I'm at. Um, we give so much supervision. We have staff who get like eight hours of uh, clinical supervision a month. Um, I've worked with a lot of people who come from other agencies or friends who say, yeah, they meet with their individual supervisor once every two or three weeks. That is not okay. <laughs> You need to, especially as a brand new therapist, to have that support all of the time. Um, so I would really encourage you when you're interviewing places, um, whether it be for an internship or a job, yes, you're, you're the one who's interviewing, and you know, but also take the time to interview them in a bit and ask those questions, um, because that's how you're going to become a good clinician. That's how you're going to figure out whether that's what you want to do. Um, a good clinical supervisor will go into it understanding that as a new clinician, you're still figuring things out. Um, they won't force you to be a clinician. They won't say, oh, well, this is what you have to do. They'll help you explore issues like transference and counter-transference. Um, I think what happens at a lot of places is, you know, people step into a clinical role um, without that good supervision and something happens with a client that triggers them or they've got 10 clients that you know it's really heavy trauma and they find themselves in a situation where they're experiencing vicarious trauma and no one's talking to them about it. And those are the people who you know exit clinical work pretty quickly. So I would say if you think 
you might want to do it, give it a try. Don't wait until after you graduate to try to do clinical work for the first time. It's going to be very hard to find a position that you'd like. So give it a try. And then when you look and you're finding somewhere, make sure the clinical supervision is a huge piece. Yes, that is great advice. I cannot, um, I cannot emphasize uh, supervision is, is key. And we try to build it in into our internships, um, but even afterwards. Um, also, um, Melissa too, um, and, and Marga, you'll find too that there's lots of social work beyond clinical practice. And uh, it's not for everyone. And I, I've had so many people who've gone in, so many students who have done a, you know, thought that they wanted to do a clinical internship. They did it and they just, they, they just really realized it wasn't for them. Um, and it's, it's better to kind of have that as a student yeah. than, yeah. Yeah, I would say I did have one of my, um, in my, my first cohort that came through, um, Mario, he was an MSW student. And like, man, Mario is a social worker through and through. He, he is. And he came to do the clinical piece. And he was currently working. Oh, gosh, where was it? I can't remember the name of the agency. Um, but essentially, he was working with um, undocumented children. And, and so that was like really part of his passion. So sitting, he, he discovered like he had clinical skills, he could do it. He, he didn't, he didn't hate it sitting in an office speaking to clients, but he recognized that that's not where he was in his life. He still wanted to go out and like boots on the ground and like, kind of like first responder sort of experience that will help you yeah. if you ever come back to clinical work. So it's not a waste. It really isn't. Everything that you experience in any role of social work, it's going to only enhance your other positions that you have. So Yeah, I, I echo that and I echo what you said, Brett. Um, I've had interns with the same exact situation who have come in. That's what they thought they were going to do. Um, and they find out that they don't, you know, it's not their thing. Maybe they were expecting to see clients make more progress. And that's, you know, that's something you learn in, in clinical work, especially with trauma, is that it can take a long time. People can get worse before they get better. Um, holding space and sitting in, a, in that uh, discomfort. Some people are like, you know what, this isn't what I was expecting. People sometimes love it and other people say, well, this was great because I learned this is not what I want to do. Um, and I will say there are so many different things you can do with social work, which is why it's so great. Um, my best friend is a social worker. We went to grad school together. And we could not be more opposite in what we want to do with social work. Um, you know, I, from being, I stepped in grad school, knew I wanted to do clinical work in, you know, some capacity. That's what I've been doing. And I remember meeting her and I hadn't really interacted with a lot of uh, social workers who are outside of the clinical sphere of things. And I remember meeting her and she was like, oh, that sounds horrible. Like, I don't want to work with people one-on-one -on -one or a group like I would never want to do that. And she taught me about this whole other side of social work that I hadn't really explored, doing more policy work, doing advocacy work. Um, and she's had a great career um, on the other side of non-clinical. So it really, there are tons of opportunities besides um, if you decide like, oh, this isn't what I, what I thought it was going to be. This is not my jam. There, there are other opportunities for you. Excellent. Well, thank you. We have some great, um, questions in the chat and they kind of exactly lead kind of almost seamlessly into what we're we're talking about um and um so so one 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 is um uh a student and asked uh Ket, ketiana has asked how competitive is the process to obtain an internship at your organization and what do you look for in in in, in interviewing students and then also i'm gonna add one more question that is um, students are looking, where should they consider internships? So maybe um, if you guys know of, of agencies beyond your own that students can kind of hear and, and look into um, as they are applying. So those, those, those two questions, kind of what do you guys look for as an intern? How, what's that process, that interview process like? And then also what, what are uh, some clinical opportunities you may know of for interns in the, in the area? Um. I'll go. Uh, my program, I can accept um, up to 10 interns. I actually have the physical space for 10 um, interns. It's fairly competitive for, for me at Bayless. Bayless has had interns um, as long as they've been 
around and they were established in 1981. And our current, uh, like kind of Melissa, the Melissa of Bayless, um, she started as an intern and she did her internship with Bayless. She got licensed at Bayless and now she's like literally running all of the behavioral health and she's not the only one. I would say about half of our leadership team started as interns. So Bayless specifically really believes in the value of not just having an intern come in and like, oh, this is free labor. Like that's not like, it can be like that. So you gotta be careful. If you get those vibes, please like, you know, listen to yourself that way. Um, but really it's about the quality because I I always say like a bad therapist is worse, worse than no therapist at all. So like, that's what I don't wanna be like a part of is anybody who feels like they can't do this work um, once they're done with the internship. Um, but what do I look for? Um, I think this kind of is a lot with social workers. Like, I think sense of humor is really important because uh, we deal with such heavy, heavy things all the time um, that if we didn't like have a good sense of humor, we'd probably just cry a lot and that wouldn't be good for anybody. Um, but I, I, I want to know what's most important to people. Like, what are your values? Where do you see yourself? Um, and what are you proud of? about yourself and what you've accomplished so far in your life. I think that most skills can be taught. If you have a, 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 somebody who's open to learning, most skills can be taught. However, there are a few things that are specific to social work that I don't think that you can really teach. And I always am looking for that um, sense of like empathy, connection, compassion, um, and commitment to the field itself, because a part of our social work, you know, code of ethics, um, and we're sort of speaking to social justice, but it is also that giving back that, like, how can I help another social worker move a little bit further in their life and their career? Um, so that's something I'm very passionate about. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, I, I think it's about people who want to learn, who can be flexible, um, and people who really understand that there's there's more to life and clinician work just in, inside that room. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with that. And there are, there are so many opportunities for social workers. We just have to dig a little sometimes. And I know the Sonia platform is not like super user friendly sometimes, and it's hard for you guys to navigate through. Uh, but here's the thing, social work is actually a pretty small community. And this is why like you never burn any bridges because you end up reconnecting with people that you went to school with, with somebody you had an internship with, and those are invaluable resources, invaluable to you. Um, so, you know, I have people that I know that work at a new leaf. I have people that I, I know at JFCS. I have a very good friend who's the um, head of case management for Honor Health in Scottsdale. I could call him and be like, yo, like I have somebody who's really interested in medical social work. What are we going to do about it? Do you have any openings? So there's a lot of networking, of course, that happens within our community as social workers, but um, they are out there. And I think that if, if somebody has an understanding of what social work is, I don't know why we couldn't make a case for that person to have an internship at an agency because of the vast education that we have. So. Um. I agree with everything Margaret said. Um, at our, for our internship program, it is competitive. Um, we only accept second year interns um, for the MSW program. Um, we consider ourselves to be a very advanced uh, internship. We have tried it with first year MSW students. We need someone who's been through all the basic clinical skills classes, hopefully has learned at least some of CBT, uh, motivational interviewing, um, we look for people who have experience in the field um, before. It doesn't need to be in, you know, direct clinical work, um, but the interns we choose are usually people who have, you know, worked at some other agency in some capacity. Um, the ones that we are quick uh, to take are ones who have done some version of clinical work. So case management, um, something like that. When we see that someone's well, been Melissa, at the... that, 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 I'm going to interrupt you, Key, because that is, that is real key, because a lot, we have some bachelors, some BSWs mm -hmm. who are wanting to get in the field. So mm -hmm. obviously they probably wouldn't go into your guys' agency, it sounds like that. But I, I, if I heard you right, what you said is um, if, if they could think ahead and choose 
kind of direct practice uh, uh, case manager, that type of internships, that would put them at a, an advantage when they were looking um, for yeah. that. Is, is that, is that, did I understand you right? Yeah, I, I think we definitely look for people with experience. Um, you know, we get some interns who have been in the field for a while. who are going back to get their masters. Um, that's always great because they might have worked like as a case manager. But definitely, if someone hasn't been employed in the field, we want to see what those other internships were. Um, and for us, it has to. We have to see some type of. You know, we've we've worked with people who have done more mentorship type internships, um, but there has to be some work individually with people or with groups. Um, we have to see that people can work in more of a fast paced environment. I am a big believer that interns need to be prepared um, when they graduate to enter the world of social work. Um, and I will tell you that um, when I first came to JFCS, I felt like that that wasn't the case. I felt like we had some interns with really small caseloads um, that weren't adequately prepared. Um, so over the past three and a half years, I've really encouraged the, the clinicians who run the internship program to provide more of a robust experience and to make sure not that, you know, interns would have 35 uh, clients or anything like that, but that they are seeing more than one or two people a day if they're there for a full day. Um, if not, you're going to enter the, the workforce and it's going to be kind of stunning. And we've had a couple of people um, who we've who we've taken that, you know, their internship where they went wasn't as as rigorous. So I would ask about that too when you're in, when you're interviewing places. Like, what would the caseload be? How many people will I probably see in a day? Those types of questions. What um, is the us, average caseload for for uh, interns that you guys will think? What was I it? I um anywhere from like six to ten. Um, but I also am a huge, huge um, um, fan of group therapy. So all of my interns understand and are going to be leaving the internship knowing how to lead a group. So um, group therapy and individual therapy is um, what like a combination of the caseload. But but I try to keep it small. Um, if someone's doing like a 16 hour a week, like an ASU internship, um, I feel like half of that time 40, 40 to 50% of that time should be doing direct service. Um, usually for interns, it's more on the 40%. Um, what we have to keep in mind though is no shows and cancellations. Um, and if you haven't done clinical work uh, in the nonprofit sector, like welcome to no shows and cancellations. Um, and so, you know, we're hoping that interns will see, you know, maybe seven people, seven or eight people a week if they're doing 16 hours a week. Um, and so that means a caseload usually of 10 or 11. Um, it just kind of depends um, on the populations that they're working with. We right. see usually about 25% no-show rate. So our clinicians are expected to, 60% um, of their time is expected to be billed as direct service with clients. Um, that's something you'll hear about a lot of places, you know, productivity expectations. We don't have any of those expectations for interns. But I think it's really important that in an internship, you're getting kind of that experience. So I would say probably 10 to 12 at the most, um, but we hope for seven or eight clients a week that actually come. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, a, a quick, uh, we, again, students, thank you so much for your questions. I can tell you're very engaged and I really, I really appreciate that. Um, one is, um, do, do, if a student's graduated and wants to maybe apply at Bayless or JFC, JFCS, do they, um, do, should they wait until they graduate or can they start putting the applications now? They can start. Um, actually, I was hoping to reach out to Diana later today to ask her to post something for me. We are hiring now. Um, it's uh, it's pretty crazy right now. There's a lot of uh, things happening in the world of mental health. We are hiring now. So if you are about to graduate with your MSW, um, you can send me an email, you can send me your resume, um, or easiest probably go to Indeed. Um, well, if you haven't graduated, send me, send me an email. I'm sure Brett can get my information out um, with your resume. We're, we're doing interviews now. We have the option of sometimes hiring people before they graduate. Um, we've done that with some of our interns where if you're, it's like April, you know, and you're graduating in May, 
we will we will start someone um and then and we can start them part-time and then when they graduate full-time if you know something like that or we can just interview now with the understanding that the start date is right after um graduation so i actually think you know when, when I was uh, when I was finishing my second year internship, I was super stressed about getting a job. Um, and I told, you know, I kind of started looking around uh, early and luckily my internship, you know, placement is where I ended up working. But if you can do something before you graduate, I highly encourage because when everyone graduates at the same time, everyone's trying to get a job at the same time. So try to be ahead of that, you know, curve and, and start doing things now. Um, do your agencies have any um, uh, work available uh, for BSWs or is, are you guys look, so Bayless does has some we BSW, do. okay. Mm -hmm. BSW work, um, you can still be licensed with your BSW. So don't, don't just count your BSW, okay? Like the, I, people are like, oh, what about therapy? Yes, I understand, like you do have to have a master's degree in, in social work, counseling, Family, marriage and family therapy in order to bill insurances and you have to be licensed. So that's really important to know there. The BSW work is also critical because it is, it is still the professional work that we have as social workers. So case management work, um, specifically at Bayless, we have a lot of um, what we call coordination of care because we're integrated and we have behavioral health and medical health and psychiatric health having a social worker be a part of somebody who, what we call is like a high utilizer. So somebody who's really using their insurance a lot, has a lot of readmissions to a hospital. Like a BSW is a great um, person to have in working with um, somebody like that because we have that that training of the macro and, and it just is very helpful for, um, like if they're discharging a lot and they don't have a safe place ho at home, um, that's where we really see those BSWs come in and help coordinate all of that care. So there's a lot of, there's still a lot that you can do um, with your BSW. You can work, I've seen um, like in, in assisted livings. I know a lot of assisted livings that have BSWs in there to help with programming, um, relationships, you know, that sort of thing. So there's definitely work out there, but get licensed. Um, I would I would agree. There's tons of opportunities out there for BSWs. Um, at our agency, we have it's a little limited, but we do have a program that um, we, we work with BSWs. Um, and again, I love the social workers, so they kind of get a, a, a step above in my book. Um, we have an in-home program. It's, uh, we have two in-home programs that are child welfare contracts. Um, if you haven't done in-home work, it's something if you want to do clinical work, I, I can't recommend enough. Um, it's very different, but if you can do in-home work, you can do it all. And I will say that when I look to hire someone who maybe hasn't been a therapist before, if they've done in-home work, that's good with me because it's challenging. Um, you're in someone else's environment. There's also tons of benefits um, and you get to see progress firsthand. So the staff that we have working in those programs, you know, they're going into work with families, teaching parenting skills, doing some behavioral health interventions. Um, you know, they're doing some motivational interviewing. They're working with providing resources. They're helping set up uh, systems within the home for incentives um, with the goal of keeping the kids in the home. So one of our programs, the goal is to keep the kids in the home or to get the kids back in the home. Um, our other program that's in home is parenting skills specifically. Um, like I said, both of those programs are really rewarding. Um, the staff that have worked in those programs have stayed for, for years. We don't have a lot of turnover, but we are hiring. So um, yeah, definitely. If you have a BSW, that would be a great type of job. And most agencies in town have some type, the bigger agencies will have some type of in-home program where a bachelor's is what they're gonna look for. In Arizona, we have kind of this three-tiered process um, for, category, for categories as far as access. So you have your BHPs, your BHTs, and your BHPPs. I see a couple of people kind of like, yeah. Um, so a behavioral health paraprofessional would be someone who um, has a bachelor's in an unrelated degree, or I think it could be a high school diploma with five years in the field. When you graduate with your bachelor's in social work, you are automatically the second category, which is a behavioral health technician. Lots of jobs hire for behavioral health technicians. Um, so you have a leg up in that, in that way. 
you become a BHP, a behavioral health professional, when you get a license. And it doesn't have to be an independent license. It could be the LBSW, it could be the associate masters, I'm an LMSW, I'm a BHP. As far as working with access populations, this is the lingo that you'll hear. Um, and so being a BHP, having a bachelor's in a related field like social work, you're automatically in that category. You have a lot more opportunity open for you. Excellent. I cannot thank you enough. I, 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 I don't know if the students feel, but I, by the engagement, I wish we had another hour. This, is, this hour has gone by so quickly. Um, I just want to thank you both so much. Melissa, do you mind uh, putting your email in the chat? Margaret, Margaret put her email in the yeah, chat. That's and the best way to reach me. And I don't like, I don't know, like what, like if this, if this is all going to shut down right at 11, like I thought this was going to go a little bit longer. So I have more availability if there's specific questions that people want to ask or get answered. Um, well, un unfortunately, we, we're using the same room for another uh, panel. Okay, gotcha. But um, yeah, but, okay. but it's on licensure. So you're welcome to stay on market if you want to talk more about licensure. <laughs> yeah. I actually um, might because that was that that has a lot. There, that's a big part of what we're dealing with right yeah. now with licensure. Yeah, yeah, and it's something that we as at ASU are trying to do a lot better as making sure that our students are are, are ready as, when they graduate with um, with their MSW. Um, yes, yeah, so I want to thank you both. Melissa put her information in the 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 chat. Students, thank you so much for your in, engagement. Just really appreciate this we try to get to as many questions i've also been answering just general questions in the chat as well um thank you thank you so much